bit more difficult for Stu because he watches Matty at every game and now they're allowing crowds back. You'll probably do that, Stu, wouldn't you? Yeah, yeah, I, I will do most definitely. I spoke to the sporting director the other day and it's obviously still a grey area around they can go, who's allowed in, what allocation's going to go to, obviously the most important people uh, would be the season ticket holders, and rightly so. Um, so it's just, there's still grey areas of of what phase actually the ground at Villa is, how many they am allowed in and whatever. I mean, I've tried, tried to get into a game, but it's just run by the Premier League. You can't get anywhere near it. So I'm, yeah. I miss my son's Premier League debut. But listen, we, we can't complain about that. But I'm hoping it's going to be after Christmas, yeah. And, 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 and let's talk about that, Stuart, because, you know, your son, Matty, is, is, is playing for Aston Villa. I think it was a £16 million pound transfer from, from Nottingham Forest. And obviously he made his way in the game by... Um, the, the, the footballer used to play at the wreck after each game when him is, and, and his brother used to kick the ball around on the wreck when we were yeah. doing the interviews. So obviously all the shot get a, a little signing on fee for, for what we contributed to to his yeah. um, progression in the game. Right, but, I, spent, um, I spent it all. <laughs> <laughs> but obviously you're extremely proud of, of, of the progression that, that he's made as a footballer. But this is a different world now, the Premier League, isn't it? It's a totally different world to, to anything that's ever been before. Yeah, very very much so. It's, it's a different world and it mixes with, you know, the, the so-called better players in, in this country. But I'm not just saying this because he's my boy and obviously he's he's not changed as a person. And, and those days at, uh, at Aldershot, his early days, being in the dressing room, being in the dressing room at Wimbledon, Upset, upsetting Eric now and again with him kicking balls in the dressing room. I mean, Terry was really, you know, he never used to turn him. He, he, they used to be in dressing rooms all the time. So they've they've seen how a dressing room works when he was, you know, a, a, a younger lad. And I think that's been great experience. He may not, he may not sort of realise it, but, you know, he still talks about now, you know, watching the Gary Abbotts, watching the Danny Kedwells and the John Maines of Wimbledon. And he still talks about that now. And uh, having that sort of upbringing in being by the side of Terry and myself in many dressing rooms, you know, Canvey used to come on the coaches with us. That's had a massive, you know, importance in his football career. And uh, he, he experienced some lows early on when he was, you know, rejected by Fulham and Chelsea and when the Wickham Academy so he's where he's got to he's he's, he's earned, you know he's gone the hard way and uh, everything he's you know he's getting now he, he, he fully deserves and just to, I'm going to come to round it up again or round it up shortly but you did get back in the game for a while, Stuart. You had a little time at Luton Town when they had a FA Cup run and uh, and beat Norwich City and and, and Scott Rendell would have uh, scored the uh, the winner in that game. Yeah, um, going back to uh, obviously all the shot days, Paul Buckle, who I'm in contact with now, lives in California, got a great lifestyle. He's uh, married to Rebecca, who works for the SPN over there. Um, he got the Luton job and um, he rang me up one day he says what are you up to I went not a lot he went come and work with me at Luton so I went over met him met Gary the chairman um, and obviously went to work with him he had a management team of Carl Emerson myself and and Paul I wasn't there that long um, I wouldn't say I particularly enjoyed my time there I enjoyed Paul because he's a good friend of mine um, but yeah, I got back in, in into it for a period of time, and uh, we he lost his job because his um, his wife Rebecca just got the job in America, and he wanted to go to America, so um, he left. And then a friend of mine, Terry John, still took over, and he had a he had a, a guy called Terry Harris who worked with him, and so I I stepped aside, and, and they took over and did really well there. And I just wanted to have a little touch with both of you on, on, on strikers, because we, we talked there about uh, Scott Rendell, who came back to Aldershot. He, of course, he was a young lad at Aldershot and went away, had a really good career, came back to Aldershot and was involved in our two playoff runs 
um, uh, under Gary Waddock. And then I'll just look at other strikers. Danny Hilton would have been, I think you would have uh, given him his debut, Terry, Danny Hilton, who's gone on to have a, a, a great career. Yeah, he has. He was, he was always a bundle of energy and a bundle of trouble. Um, even now, I watched him recently, and he's still elbowing people off the ball. And, uh, very talented boy. Uh, used to get the train up from Paddington. And uh, I think Martin Call can take a great deal of credit for bringing him through the youth side and probably Scott Rendell as well. And, um, you know, Martin, Martin uh, should take a lot of credit for... Uh, what he's done for the shots as well, because he's a proper shot through and through, and he's he is technically a fantastic coach. He worked with me at Basingstoke, and it didn't work out because basically the the players weren't good enough to interpret the way Martin wanted to play. Martin is a Pep Guardiola, uh, Jurgen Klopp pressing, and and everything's about technical ability and and, and systems of play. And there comes a level where the boys weren't capable of doing it. So I do feel a bit guilty about Martin because I took him there and then Martin left. And that's no reflection on Martin's coaching ability at all. Martin is one of the best coaches I've ever worked with in my life. And technically, the higher up he went, the more he'd be appreciated. So I hope he gets back in the game soon. And, and one other striker who probably went on to have a, a career, you know, in the Premier League. Aaron McLean, and he played, would have played with, with when both of you were uh, were involved. Um, Aaron and he sort of when he when he left Aldershot, I think he went to Grays, but the, he certainly progressed his career after that. Yeah, I'll blame Stuart for that because um, obviously Stuart. Where, was in, where did we get him from? The forwards. Um, <laughs> Where did you sign him from? Can you remember? Was it Orion? Was it Orion? Yeah, I signed him oh, from Grey. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, it was no, no, signed him from Lake Norrin, sorry. Yeah, signed yeah. him from Lake Norrin. I remember he played in a pre-season game at Slough, or it might not have been a pre-season, it was a trial game. Trial game, yeah. And I remember I loved him. I don't remember if you loved him or not. Um, so I'm taking credit for loving him. Then we got him in. Fantastic smile on his face whenever he played. A joy to work with. Unbelievable pace. Quads you die for. And to be fair, we used to do shooting practice every week. He couldn't hit the back of a bus. No. And uh, he was brilliant and he could cause all sorts of problems but never took his chances. And to be fair to Stimo, uh, he had him at Gray's and... It took. I didn't. I don't think he scored for something like thirty odd games, and then when he started scoring, he was a revelation. And that grey side that Stimo had come and played us at the wreck and played us off the park. That was a hell of a side he had there. Well, he had everything. Didn't he had Aaron. He had, like I say, when we had him, he wasn't a great finisher, but he had pace. He had strength. He was fantastic in the air. Yeah, brave. Yeah, he had that low central gravity, didn't he? But you, you talk about strikers, Graham. You know, from from the you know you look at any good team and the teams what we've had. You know, you, from you know your Gary, your, your Gary Abbott's at Aldershot, and your uh, you know your, your Tim Sills, and and going back to Wimbledon, your John Maines and your Danny Kedwells. We've had some, we've had some great, we've had some great forwards, some really yeah. good. And uh, I think if you can get that compartment right, you've got a chance. And yeah. One other player, again, I think he was one of your, your lads, Terry, who, who's, um, again, he came back to Aldershot and became a bit of a cult hero with Aldershot because he scored uh, some uh, fantastic goals in terms of uh, one at Woking, which kept us up in the first year when we came out of administration and minus 10 points and scored against Portsmouth in the FA Cup. But I'm sure he's one of your lads. He's, um, who's now manager in the South End is uh, Mark Molsey. Yeah. Oh, I absolutely love Mark. I, I speak to him on a on a regular basis. Uh, I have to say, I told him not to take the South End job. Um, I couldn't see how that was going to be a winner from being a top man at Weymouth and working at Bournemouth and going to South 
South End. Mark's always been his own man. Um, he showed me a photo of his first league game at for Hayes, and it was at Basingstoke, and he was sent off, and I've got him in a headlock, pulling him off the pitch. <laughs> and you think, I'm, blimey, the game's changed a bit. <laughs> yeah. I'm tracking him off the pitch. And he sent the photo to me going, Hey, Al Gaffer, I learned a lot from you. Um, <laughs> he's a lovely lad who's done brilliant with a manager. I, and don't get me wrong, I think the order shop, current order shop manager, I've met him and I've listened to him and I've seen his team play. I think he's a fantastic manager. And please give him time uh, to, to do well because managers don't get enough time. I would have given the job to Mark Mosey when he was at Weymouth. I would have given him that job because he's... He is. Uh, he knows what Aldershot are about. He's technically a fantastic manager. He's got brilliant connections, um, and I know he'll do. Uh, in a way, I hope he gets out of Southend because I don't think it's. I don't think it's the right club for anybody to be in. And um, again, I know it's the attraction of football league, but blimey, you're only as good as the players you're able to get in. And um, as Stuart said, touched on earlier, it was only when we didn't get the recruitment right that, you know, we fell off the ladder. And one thing I haven't touched on for, for the pair of you is you did team up again at Margate um, a few years later. Graham, to don't know. remind me about those two and a half hour journeys to Margate. <laughs> <laughs> Five hour round trip. That proves I can add up anyway. Um, what was the what was the chap's name? Les, 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 Bob Lasley. Great guy. I mean, well, honestly, a fantastic guy. Who, if I if I compare him to the the manager, sorry, the the chairman of Basingstoke, who was selling the club down the river and looking to make money. Bob was nothing like that. Bob was a multi, well, not a multi-millionaire. He was a millionaire who wanted to invest in his local club. He gave us as big a budget as you could ever want. And we struggled with that budget to get, we, we, we got players that we knew were quality players that could play the type of football we wanted. Um, but we missed we missed the trick in the fact that in all our best sides we've had young hungry players fighting, scrapping, and wanting to do. If you have a team of people who have been there and done it, they've been there and done it, and they ain't gonna want to come to Clapton on a Tuesday night. We used to train in London. Um, all I can say about I've got pleasant memories. We got promotion in a playoff final that we won without penalties against uh, a very good Hendon side, very physical Hendon side. And we played some lovely football at times too, didn't we? Yeah, we did. Yeah, we had... Uh... Graham, this is, and... this, is, this, is, this is how it worked. I'm on holiday. I'm on a beach, 85 degrees. I'm just drinking a, a glass of San Miguel. My phone goes and it's brownie. He goes... What are you doing? I goes, I'm on holiday. I'm relaxing. He goes, do you fancy uh, getting back into it? I went, he went, there's this little club. It's just down the road. It's not that far. Margate. I went, Margate? I went, Brown, it's miles away. He goes, I've been, a met, I've been a met the owner. He's brilliant. He wants, he gives us a good budget. He wants us to get into the conference and back-to-back -back promotions and he'll back it financially. When you're back, I'm back on the weekend. Okay, well, he says, um, I'm going to accept the job. He says, can I say yes on your behalf? So did all the financials over the phone. I went, Brownie, I need a bit more money than that. You need to put a couple more zeros on that. Anyway, he got it, me. Came back off holiday. He went, I'll pick you up. We're going to Margate tonight, our first training session. I went, tell, what's the facilities like? He went, eh, they're not bad. He says, the pitch is not bad. He says, it's on a bit of a slope, but... Anyway, he picks me up. Two and a half hours later, we were stuck on the M25 in traffic. <laughs> I got a brand. This, this is a nightmare. Anyway, we get there. Dressing rooms are porter cabins. And everything. the physio. He ain't got an ultrasound machine. He ain't got no tape. He ain't got no rub. He ain't got a 
He ain't got a bench to rub the players on. I mean, Brown, and this is going to be a disaster. Anyway, it turned out to be okay. We had new dressing rooms built and pitch was nice and we got what we wanted and we did all right. I, I enjoyed it there, apart from the travelling. It was just too far. We yeah. got a training facility halfway there, didn't we, in London, which was a training good training you still had to crawl around the M25. Yeah. Um, lovely people, though. Really lovely people. And and a well-meaning chairman uh, who, who is now on the board at Wolves, I believe. So, yeah. so, so, so the question for both of you is, are the, are the dugout days over? Are the what days? Are the dugout days over? Well, Stu don't need it anymore. Stu is... Uh, well, it's Stu, you, you, you explain what you're doing first and then I'll explain. Well, uh, they are for me, Graham. I mean, I, I look back with fond memories, but I get um, I get a lot of satisfaction. Like I said to you, to you earlier, I lost a lot a lot of my kids' uh, early lives growing up and my wife, Barbara, used to take them to school and do all that. I missed all that because of work and football. And now I enjoy my daughter's living in America. She's on a golf scholarship, so she's back at the moment. So I enjoy playing golf with, with my daughter and watching my son play football. And my other son, Adam's uh, got a really good business. So I enjoy being around my kids and, you know, more so, you know, watching him play football at, uh, at a really good level. So I, I get massive satisfaction from that. I Many a time people have asked me, you know, you must miss it. You're you all the shot days and your Wimbledon days. And I don't because uh, I've got that uh, other thing, what fills the gap. You know, I'm still involved in football. I I look after some younger players and give them the guidance and um, the advice that I think what I've gained over the years with my, with my sons playing football. So I, I enjoy that and um, I get a lot of satisfaction from it. Brilliant. And Terry? Well, mine's a rather awkward one because I'm just about to uh, relinquish my post at uh, Basingstoke. I've been chairman there for the uh, last couple of years. It seems a bit longer. Um, going into running a club is certainly opened my eyes as, as far as boardrooms are concerned and uh, however chairman and CEOs I've worked under have have been. It is mind-bogglingly painful to be a chairman of a club. Every single problem comes through you. We've had problems at Biden's Oak without boring whatever shot supporters we've still got on here. Um, we have been fighting for our ground. We've got back to Basingstoke but we still haven't got our own ground. So we still have to pay to hire the ground, to hire the AstroTurf, to hire the education facilities for our academy. Without boring the parents off here, we've got back to Basingstoke via uh, the council's ground, but we are fighting or the next phase. So in other words, I've helped in a small way, to contribute to us getting back to Basingstoke and completing phase one, keeping the club alive, celebrating the 125th anniversary later in the year and keeping football in Basingstoke. That's fine and the club can tick over. For it to grow and become an order shot or a Wimbledon, which it should want to do with 160,000 residents, it needs its own ground. And that is five years away, 10 years away. And that's a project for, for someone else to take on and to drive with a hunger and a drive because you've got to pester councils, you've got to pester businesses, you've got to, you've got to, you've got to be a proper community club. And that, that, again, it brings me to the Wimbledon model. They're a proper community club. When they talk about can we go back to Merton, can we... Um, can we get this off the council? Can we get that? Look at the leverage they got. They supplied, I don't know, 140,000 meals last week. You know, like, what? Hot meals? You're going to supply to, to hospitals? So they're a proper community club. And that's what Basingstoke needs to be. But it's, a, it's literally a journey that's another 10 years. 
and I'm 68. Would I like to do something else in football? Yes, I would. Do I want to embark on a journey that involves different skill sets to what I've got? So you're talking about dealing with Section 106 money, dealing with politicians, be it Maria Miller, be it the local councillors, be it Hampshire County Council. They'll tell you what they want you to hear while you're there. And then are they really bothered unless it's, uh, there's a, an election coming up? Are they really bothered? You've got to engage the community. Wimbledon have engaged the community, not just the football community. They've engaged the whole community of Merton. That's something all the shop need to do. And that's something hopefully Basin State will do. Um, will I get back into football? I don't want to go into the dugout. Um, it's too stressful. It's too hard and time's moved on. You have to remember so many things when when you're training a team, managing a team, doing patterns of play, set plays. You have to remember so much. You know, I know Roy Hodgson's doing it, but I think that's a younger man than me. And I think when we when we were su- successful, when we had the good times at, at mm. all the shot and at, uh, at Wimbledon, we knew every player. We knew every player who played for, for the opposition. You know, we knew the best four or five left backs, the best four or five forwards. Whether you got them or not was a different thing, but we knew everybody. Now, I mean, I'll, I'll still keep in contact with non-league football. You know, you look at the names and unless you go to a local game, I don't know anybody. Don't know anybody. No. Uh, no. I think once you lose that connection, it's very, it's very, di- okay, um, it's not unachievable, but... It's uh, it's very difficult. Very and difficult. and so uh, w- what you don't forget is the sleepless nights you had, and in the end, I was getting proper stomach ache watching the games. I don't do I need that stress? Do I need to go home and start shouting at the missus? I don't need it anymore. It's a I'm, it's a young man's game. I think I'm just as bad down there watching my son play football. Any parent what watches their son play yeah. football whether it be conference level, Ryman level, or Premier League, I, I, I can't enjoy it. I'm just no, too... Really, my, wife, no. my wife can't even watch it. She'll go to a game and she'll stay in the players' bar. She can't actually <laughs> watch it live. And I'm I'm nervous watching him. So, just, um, just, going on, just going on there, Stuart, because when you think about it as well, yeah, everything your boy does as a footballer and probably off, off the field as well, will be scrutinised at the level he's play, playing at. So if he makes a mistake, everyone's on it now. Whereas if you go back even 15, 20 years, none of that would be applicable. But now there's nowhere they can turn if they do something wrong. Yeah, yeah. It, it is. I mean, we live in a different world, Graham, with social media. And, uh, you know, I've always said to him, uh, whether you play, whether you're man of the match one week, or you, you don't play so well next week, stay off social media. Don't don't let it. Listen, social media, the platform is great for whatever you want to to use it for, but don't don't use it for getting a pat on the back or somebody giving you a, a boot up the backside. Don't use it for that. It's not there. It's not because you know you have to be. The thing I'm saying my, with my with my uh, son Matthew, he's very very strong men- mentally. He's got a um, he don't don't if he has a poor game or he'll give the ball away. Don't affect him, and he's he's lucky in that because a lot he, a lot of people are not that mentally strong. And uh, I say to him, stay off social media. Whether you you know he's got he's just got in uh, team of the week last week uh, when he played against Arsenal, and I said forget all these plaudits It's a pat on you on as good as your last game. Just keep const- keep a level headed. Keep your feet firmly on the floor. Enjoy your football, enjoy your journey, because his his journey's been you know fantastic from being in the Wickham Academy to playing in the Premier League. He's I'm I'm really proud of him, and he deserves a lot of praise from 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 me. But don't get too carried away. Just stay on your journey, know what your you know your goal is, and just enjoy enjoy your career. So, my final question, really, because you know, I'm sure you all want to watch this. I'm celebrity, whatever it's called. I'm sure you're you're. Desperate to go and watch that. So, um, Aldershot. I just want to talk a little bit about Aldershot to, to, to wrap it up because this is a predominantly Aldershot program, of course. You'll have 
been watching from the outside looking in and you, you just see that the club you know got into the football league and, and and then got relegated and then it's had a turbulent period since a couple of playoffs but um could have been relegated out of the conference at one stage and went into administration so what your thoughts on on, on order as such it's gone oh well i'll answer it then um yeah still got um Great memories for me. Uh, still, still uh, watch out for their result in the National League. That's the result I'm looking at. Um, I go down there at least once or twice a year and watch. Whenever I go down, I tend to go in the um, family enclosure, the family stand. Love, love the view from there. Um, always. Always get a nice reception. Always lovely, friendly people there, and the the pitch in the ground for me will always be iconic. Uh, I haven't seen the new Plough Lane yet, but it's very difficult to imagine any more than the new Brentford Stadium could be Griffin Park. New Plough Lane is going to be obviously a little a little bit more concretey and distant than the old plough lane. The wreck for me is an occasion. I, I park up the top of the hill. I walk down the hill. I love hearing the crowd. I love hearing the East Bank. I love uh, walking down there. It is, you could be going to Burnley or you could be going to a Northern League football league. That's a proper league cup ground. And they have proper support and... Uh, I think, I think, hopefully, if they can get this lease Wait, and Brian. get, hopefully, yeah, hopefully, if they get that lease and they um, invest money from people that will invest in a hundred-year lease, that can be a fantastic, iconic stadium again, and it and that you can be a football league club again without doubt. Um, because you have to generate the money somehow. Um, love the club, always will do, and hope they uh, uh, hope they can consolidate first of all, build the new stadium, and well, the sky's the limit. Then, isn't it? Sorry, Graham, sure. technical fault then, as in battery went. <laughs> <laughs> So your own thoughts about Aldershot, you'll have seen the, you know, the, the, the up and downs they've had probably over the last decade or so. But, um, you know, still in the National League, it's, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a difficult league these days because you've got so many clubs who have come down from the Football League who think they, you know, you, you look at it now, you've got teams like Chesterfield struggling. Wrexham yeah. have had a difficult time until they've just been recently bought out and, you know, you'd think that they're going to push on now. But Hartley Pool are another one. Torquay got relegated out of it a couple of years ago and came back. Yeah. And it's a it's a tough, tough league. It is, yeah. I mean, like I said to you earlier, Terry was there five years. I was there eight years. You don't work at some some at a place for eight years and just erase it from your memory. You know, you every time there's a, a game of football on the weekend, you always look at how, how they've got on, like I do with Wimbledon. And, uh, you know, I've got really fond memories of me working there and being there. And, not, not only just for me, but for my kids when they was younger. They had, you know, great, great memories of them when they was uh, mascots and things like that. So now look at look for the result every time they play and hopefully good things are ahead for them. So I think that wraps it up, gentlemen. We've done nearly three hours. That's pretty good going. That's, yeah. Um, fantastic going. But you know, on a serious note, I just want to thank you both for... A, taking the time to to, to talk, talk this evening. I really enjoyed it. I think we've had a, a bit of fun and I think people will be very intrigued and interested in you talking about your, your footballing careers, especially your times at Aldershot, but actually some of the other experiences mould into the whole thing anyway because it's like a journey that you've both experienced in football and it's a whole package. Um, but I'd also like to thank you for what you contributed to Aldershot over, as you say, Terry for five years, Stuart for eight years, I was involved in, 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 in a lot of those years as well. Thoroughly enjoyed them. Thoroughly enjoyed working with a pair of you. Great to see you've gone on and had great success in the game. And uh, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll see you soon uh, down at Aldershot when the crowds are, are back in full and uh, 
I think it's 30 years coming up in uh, in 2012, so we, maybe we'll have a reunion. Yeah, very much so. Lovely. That Thank you very much, good. gentlemen. Have you got anything else you'd like to say before I go? Uh, you're both welcome at Villa anytime you want. Once we've got the uh, the crowds back in, and uh, we'll have a we'll have a nice little weekend up there. I know Bran is itching to I'm come having, on yeah. uh, and uh, come and watch him. So you're both both welcome, Bran. Lovely. Thank you very much. All right. Yeah, I'll definitely be taking you up on that. Okay. See you soon. Yeah. Cheers, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thank Brownie, you. I'll speak Thank to you, you soon. See you Cheers. later. Bye. Bye.